Welcome to the Future of Structures podcast, where we talk to the experts who are evolving our buildings for tomorrow. And here is your host, Adam Jones. Today we speak with Jonathan Cartledge about the policy priorities for the Green Building Council of Australia. So Jonathan is part of the leadership team and the head of public affairs at the GPCA. So some of the priorities we speak about are one, achieving more livable, sustainable and healthy cities, two, securing more resilient communities, three, delivering a low carbon, high performing built environment, four, raising minimum standard through construction codes, and five, facilitating sustainable utility infrastructure. So Jonathan was an absolute legend. I hope you guys enjoyed the show as much as I did interviewing Jonathan. And without any further ado, here he is. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. I'm uh, Head of Public Affairs with Green Building Council, uh, which looks after research, government relations uh, and communications uh, across the association. And and my background, though, is absolutely in the public policy, Mm. government affairs space in a mix of associations, also in the built environment, uh, but also in the, the public sector across a whole range of portfolios from emergency management through to counterterrorism policy through to financial services Uh, and I think what's interesting stepping into into the Green Building Council is just how relevant that public policy process is in terms of uh, what we're advocating in this space. Yeah definitely so um for the I guess the one one or two percent who don't know too much about the Green Building Council so why why was it formed in the first place and what is the goal of the, the organisation? It's a great Australian story actually. The Green Building Council was formed uh, really in the aftermath of the Sydney Olympics which as many would be aware was one of the first green games uh, or the Olympics with a real sustainability mandate but mm. it was in the development of the Olympics and many of the projects that came out of it that there was this increased awareness across industry and with government that we didn't really have any common benchmarks in Australia for actually measuring sustainability. Mm. Uh, So a a bunch of industry leaders came together in in that period after the Olympics and and really developed the GBCA, which was founded in 2002, with a mandate to drive a common vision of sustainability for the built environment in Australia. Mm. Awesome. So... And how, how big is it today? So it started then and it's it's absolutely huge right now. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's it's been a it's been an amazing journey in, in fifteen years. Uh, so if we if we look back uh, in our fifth year, the Green Building Council had certified hundred projects. Uh, today we're looking at over seventeen hundred projects wow. certified across Australia. Mm. Uh, we employ fifty uh, 50 staff um, across uh, the states uh, and we have over 650 members and that's everything from uh, ASX 200 companies through to product suppliers, financiers, uh, government members constitute 10% of our membership. We've got 44 councils, 22 uh, universities, uh, every government land organisation uh, around Australia uh, mm. is committed to helping us deliver our vision, which is for healthy, productive and positive places for people in the natural environment. Phenomenal. That is just one. That, the way you said that sentence, which is like the most perfectly worded <laughs> sentence I've ever heard. Facts and figures are yeah, ready to go. So we're going to talk a little bit about the policy priorities, which um, you were one of the authors, I believe, of this. Well, the, the, the Green Building Council's policy priorities are really driven out of our, our vision, uh, which is, as I, as I said it, and our purpose, which is the sustainable transformation of the built environment. Mm. And last year, um, uh, through a lot of industry and member engagement, we delivered a new three-year strategic plan for the organisation, which revolves around four pillars, uh, which is people, planet, industry and region. Uh, But out of that, we needed to identify what are the policy priorities for the association and what we want government to do that is going to help us deliver that vision Mm. uh, and those strategic priorities in the years ahead. So coming out of that process, which was a lot of industry engagement and consultation, the board agreed uh, on five policy priorities Mm. uh, for for the association. Fantastic. So the first one is achieving more livable, productive, sustainable and healthy cities. Um, Can you explain what what this is and, and how it could be implemented yeah so uh, cities are a 
increasing focus for governments uh, around the world, uh, the increasing urbanisation of communities, 80% uh, of Australia's population live in cities. Oh, yeah. um, we've got 22 cities in Australia with populations over 100,000 people. Over 80%, well over 80% of our GDP is generated through our cities. Mm. And when we look at all the different challenges that governments are facing, whether it's in uh, health or education or social inclusion, uh, whether it's economic challenges or challenges around connecting people, a a lot of those need to be dealt with through comprehensive cities policy. Hmm. So we need to understand how we can use our cities in a policy sense to deliver those benefits across all the sorts of challenges that governments face. So they're a useful lens through which to look at policy. Yeah. So when we look at cities and cities policy in Australia, we also need to look at it in conjunction with how we're building our cities. So what mm. does the built form in our cities look like? How does that contribute to those outcomes? And when we look at that built form, it's not just buildings, of course, it's also the infrastructure and services that mm that make up our cities um, yeah. and how do they interact together and work as a system to deliver the best outcomes for our communities. Mm. So is there is there challenges at the moment in the way the, the policies are set up for our cities at the moment? Is it, is it a planning thing as well of the cities ahead? Absolutely. So I think when we look at that, we need to look at how we plan our cities in an integrated way for the long term. Mm. We need to look at how our cities operate as our system. So we it's not just that we should be looking at a piece of infrastructure in terms of moving people from A to B, but we yeah. should be looking at a piece of infrastructure in terms of how it connects people, how it creates jobs, how it builds inclusion, how it um, allows people to move in an active way that promotes better health and wellbeing outcomes. Mm. Uh, so it's taking that holistic view of infrastructure as it in integrates with urban planning to deliver better results mm. on the ground. Awesome. So at the, at the city level, I'd like to know what what their um, – so if the government, how well they've bought into it because say at the, the building level, it's easy for a developer to do it because there's, you know, direct economic benefits with marketing and the, the savings in energy and all these things. So why – so what, what's the government's response been with, with this? So I think it's really important when we look at cities to understand the different roles and responsibilities of the different levels of government. So – at a local government level, we're seeing some really fantastic leadership about the kinds of communities that they want to build. And they've got a lot of control over zoning and development assessment that enables them to take that, that leadership position. If we look at, for example, Parramatta Square, we're seeing some really great leadership um, out there in Victoria, uh, the collaboration between um, the, the local governments with responsibility for Fisherman's Bend and the mm. state government in Victoria has led to a framework for sustainability in Fisherman's Bend, which is Australia's gotcha. largest urban renewal precinct. Yeah. So we're looking at you know 80,000 people moving into Fisherman's Bend in the decades ahead. Some really fantastic outcomes in that precinct about mm. what can be delivered for, for communities, and that's through the leadership of local and state. And then at a federal level, recently we've seen the the Australian government release a national performance framework for cities, which is measuring for the first time mm. uh, through da through comprehensive data sets how our cities are performing against a range of indicators, whether they're economic or uh, environmental and focusing on livability um, or whether they're about health outcomes for those communities, actually measuring our performance and mm. providing a baseline to measure performance over time. So that's a really that's important cool. development. Yeah. And then it also at a federal level, of course, we've got Infrastructure Australia, which has a critical role to play in developing a long-term plan for, for infrastructure prioritisation in yeah. our cities. So mm. we do see leadership across the different levels of government in different ways. Yeah. That's not to say that more can't be done. There yeah. always can be. Oh, definitely. Uh, that all sounds very, very good and it's moving pretty quick. Um, another one, the second one of the policy priority was securing more resilient communities. So what is what is a resilient community and, and I guess what is this priority all about? Yeah, so I think we need to think of re resilience in a... In a really in a holistic sense, so it's 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 not just resilience to an adaptation in response to climate change, but it's resilience in terms of economic changes, demographic change. When we look at um, the changes that we know are happening to 
our population in terms of dependency ratios and population ageing and the changing nature of households in Australia. We mm. need to make sure that our communities can and adapt. Is the dependency to be ratio, uh, the, the, the ratio between people who produce or who are not retired to working? Is that exactly. Right? That's yep. exactly right. And so uh, that's going to have those and technological changes are going to have significant impacts on how we design and deliver. Uh, our communities and our built form in our communities. So when we look at, at resilience, we need to plan in the long term for that. And it goes to your original point, I think, around long term planning. When we, mm. you know, if we look to a 30 year horizon um, and we take something like, for example, uh, emissions and, mm. and the role of, of our communities in, in reducing our emissions in line with Paris commitments. Yeah. Uh, what our communities look like in 30 years to deliver that is very different to what they look like today. Yep. So we need to build them to be resilient to that future. If we look at autonomous vehicles and the impact that's going to have, we need to be designing communities now in a way that is going to enable them to mm. respond to that future mm. uh, in a way that builds productivity and sustainability. Yeah, it seems like a really interesting one because who knows where what our cities will, or buildings will look like in 30 years in communities. Yeah. Um, I was having an interesting conversation yesterday with Michael Rowe on the podcast from Ethos Oven and he was envisioning a future where, you know, with a VR virtual reality headsets, you know, there's no reason maybe to go to the office in the future so you could just sit there with a the virtual reality and do your work from home and how the utilisation of all our buildings would completely change then just because... You know, you, you might not need to go in the office every day. Well, that's it. And, and technology like that's amazing, not just um, in terms of enabling uh, new ways of working, which will be really significant, but it's also really important in terms of uh, building community engagement and understanding of what their future communities will look like. I mean, mm. I think some of that technology and its ability to deliver community buy-in into new disruptive projects that will deliver that future is really critical people yeah. if people can visualize what it's going to look like for them to live in a new community through that technology that's going to be really powerful in building uh, support for those communities and their development going forward yeah definitely and the third one was del delivering a low carbon high performing built environment yeah so this is an enormous challenge but a really critical one when we look at the Paris commitments that Australia has made to really uh, move towards net zero um, carbon emissions by 2050 mm. uh, and the consequent commitments that we've seen most of the state and territory governments make to deliver that objective. We need to look at all sectors of the economy and how they can transition to, to that low emissions future. When we look at the role the built environment then plays in that mm. space, we know that um, buildings account for some 23% of our emissions, use 50% of our electricity. But what's really exciting is that we know that using technologies that exist today, yep. we can move that built form to zero really quickly. Mm. And what that means is that it will buy us as an economy a lot more time to transition those more difficult parts of the economy to a lower emissions future. Yep. So we need to grab that opportunity in the built environment uh, to reduce our emissions, increase our energy productivity and efficiency to realise that low emissions future. And we know mm. that we can do that. The CSIRO published earlier this year, um, been a few reports this year that are really significant uh, in outlining this agenda, but the CSIRO report on um, technology pathways to a low emissions future was mm. was really great in demonstrating the importance of, of doing exactly that, of leveraging our built environment to, to get those gains quickly yep. built into the economy so that we can buy ourselves time to transition the other parts. Awesome. And um, it's probably a bit topical, but uh, do you think a tax is a part of that or do you think it's just going to happen naturally anyway? Well, I think what... When we, when we look at um, energy policy, uh, certainly what the Green Building Council is chasing and what so much of industry is chasing is certainty in policy settings. Uh, we are coming uh, into now nearly a decade of policy uncertainty in energy policy, which uh, creates that element of sovereign risk which uh, undermines long-term planning and investment for business mm. uh, in a way that delivers uh, that low emissions 
energy efficient future that we need. So certainty is absolutely critical. Uh, mm -hmm. I think when we look at the detail of uh, the national energy guarantee, certainly the devil will be in the detail. Um, but the prospect for that to really drive uh, emissions reduction in line with our Paris commitments mm. and also create the potential for those commitments to be geared up in the future yeah. uh, is encouraging. But what we do need is, is that certainty. We need the leadership uh, in the longer term uh, and particularly in relation to the built environment. We, we need to um, not just look at tax but look at a range of policy settings mm. uh, that can deliver um, that move towards net zero in the built environment that we yep. know is possible, uh, but does require government leadership. Mm. Awesome. So, uh, what are, what do you reckon? Some are, is there any other ideas of policies that might bring about these kind of changes? Yeah, absolutely. So, I think you know the built environment is not without its own challenges. I mean, mm. I think when you look at the success of the GBCA and Green Star. Uh, a lot of that is focused on um, the premium end and the, the leadership end of the office yes. market in particular, though we are seeing now um, very broad uptake of Green Star across the whole range of other sectors, whether it's uh, shopping centres or airports or mm. uh, industrial or apartments. So, so Green Star is definitely making its mark across the built environment. Um, but, it, but it is at that leadership level yep. and the challenge that we have in the built environment where we do need some some support from governments i think is in what we describe as the mid-tier sector which yeah, okay. is all of those buildings built between say 1960 and 20 2000 that have pretty awful lighting mm. air conditioning systems uh you know we know the buildings when we're in them because they're not that comfortable yeah um so so how do we move that stock which is a large percentage of our current built environment how do mm. we move that stock to be more energy efficient mm. and how do we do that when the owners of those buildings are really fragmented when they sit in sort of nameless family trusts and they're yep. not engaged in sustainability and they've got no real incentives mm. uh, in their own mind to deliver a more energy efficient air conditioning system in their building. How do we move them and encourage them to, mm. to deliver sustainability for, for the other half of the city? Yeah. And, and that does require a bit, of, a bit of government leadership. And we've seen great leadership from the federal government where we have a commercial building disclosure regime that... Um, up until July of this year sat um, at over 2,000 square metres and they dropped that yep. to, to apply to buildings over 1,000 square metres. Mm. That's a really fantastic initiative. Mm. Um, but alongside that, I think that there is scope for uh, incentives to encourage owners of those buildings to upgrade um, and maybe that is a tax incentive um, mm. for them to upgrade those services. Yep. Uh, and I think as well we need to look at commercial building disclosure as it applies to sectors outside yeah. office, as it applies to tenancies, for example, mm. um, so that we can move towards uh, the disclosure of whole building energy performance information, which, you know, at the end of the day, disclosure is around providing everyone with transparency and information to remove those gaps so that people then act. Mm. Um, so I think government can lead in some of those areas yep. to, to deliver change in the more difficult parts of the built environment. Mm. Yeah, and you've got a good segue there into, well, I guess, right, you know, raising the standards of our of our designs and our buildings, um, which is policy number four, or which is raising minimum standards through the National Construction Code. Yeah, absolutely. So this is really critically important. So if we think about all of the fantastic work happening through Green Star at the top end of the market, and then we note that there's some buildings that, existing buildings in that mid-tier sector that mm. have already been built that need um, some incentives and and um, greater transparency around their performance to, to upgrade. Uh, and then we look at what's coming into the market at the minimum standard level. So what, yeah. how are we building our buildings um, in accordance with minimum standards and, and how is that contributing or not to the emissions profile of our cities? And it's not a great story. Yeah. Um, energy uh, requirements under the National Construction Code are relative to uh, international comparisons pretty low. Yep. Uh, so there's a huge opportunity there to improve those requirements to make mm. sure that the buildings that we build to minimum standards 
actually deliver improved energy performance and help us, don't hinder us, but help us to meet our Paris commitments in the long term. Mm. But uh, as we move down that pathway, it, we, we need to make sure that industry is able to transition and plan for that change. Yeah. So through the uh, great work being championed by uh, the Australian Sustainable Built Environment Council, and I'll give a, a brief rundown of who they are. Yeah. The Australian oh, Sustainable <laughs> Built Environment Council is a, as if there weren't enough uh, peak bodies in Australia. So ASBEC, <laughs> as it's known, to give it an acronym, which is very important. You've got to have another acronym. <laughs> so ASBEC is the peak body of peak bodies in, yes. the, in the built environment um, awesome. focused on sustainability. So it represents uh, over 30 different industry and professional associations with government observer members and universities uh, all participating uh, to deliver policy recommendations to government that focus on a more sustainable built environment. So a really valuable group mm. that speaks with a common voice for industry. Yep. And upgrading minimum standards in the National Construction Code is, a, is an absolute priority for ASBEC, yep. which means that it's an absolute priority for uh, most of the uh, industry and professional associations in the, in the built environment. Mm. And what they're doing uh, is, is a really important piece of research that looks at what is required to upgrade um, the National Construction Code, what the benefits will be of that from an economic perspective, mm. to build the case for that, to feed into uh, the Australian Building Codes Board's planned upgrade in uh, 2019 for commercial and 2022 for residential, but more importantly, also set a trajectory of upgrades for the yes. code to meet our commitments moving to 2030. Okay. Uh, so that we know that by, hopefully, that by 2030, uh, buildings built under the, under the code uh, will be uh, net zero. Yeah, uh, awesome. In relation to their energy efficiency. Mm. But that's, that's, a, that's a very big piece of work. Um, it... It requires a lot of cross-industry engagement, which mm. we're doing. It requires a lot of industry support, um, but certainly signals the direction that the built environment needs to move uh, to, to deliver that low emissions future that we know we have to commit to to keep global warming below one and a half degrees. Mm. That's it. Um, and number five of the policy priority was facilitating sustainable utility infrastructure. So can you tell us a little bit about this one? Yeah, so when we talk about sustainable utility infrastructure, we're talking about, um, you, know, we're, you know, we're meeting in Barangaroo here today. Mm. Um, being pumped around us is uh, a whole lot of harbour water that's keeping the building cool um, and, and a whole lot of water that's being recycled. And I think just this week, Barangaroo announced that it, was, um, it will be exporting that that recycled water, which is a fantastic oh, wow. achievement. But mm. that's an amazing example of really just how valuable what we call sustainable utility infrastructure mm. is uh, in contributing to uh, really a new world of how we use and develop utilities in our communities. Yep. Uh, and we can do the same thing in energy uh, when we look at the technological disruption that's providing new services in communities through shared mobility services, mm. for example. Um, technology is really changing the way we build our communities. And so what we're, what we're interested in is how regulatory settings are keeping pace with that technology to enable it. Uh, gotcha. And we're, we're coming from, a, uh, from an environment that has been dominated by very large um, utility providers and networks. Mm. Um, that's the environment supported by the current regulatory regime. And what we need to move to is a regulatory environment that not only doesn't discourage, which is often mm. the case at the moment through strange planning laws or... Uh, tariff, unfair tariffs on exporting energy or water yep. uh, or fees for connection. Uh, when we're, when we're, it doesn't just discourage uh, these kinds of utilities but actually actively encourages them hmm. so that when we look at new greenfield development um, or retrofitting existing communities, we have incentives in place to ensure that they can be self-sufficient, that we can move to that environment where 
their positive contributors in terms of energy or water, um, yep. that they have access to those shared services that mm. are increasingly important as technology changes the way we design our communities. Mm. And is this moving in the right direction now? How's the response been with this? Uh, it's slow, I'd say. Yep. Um, I think there's a lot more to be done. And if you look at the recommendations coming out of the Finkel review, then actually a lot of those recommendations related to regulatory barriers to the delivery of these types of utilities. Yep. Um, so there was a, rec a really important recognition in that review that we needed to look at um, across governments how we can encourage this type of utility infrastructure. So there's a lot of work to happen. Yeah. Uh, and whether we're looking at, you know, water pricing in, and the, there's been a big review of water recycled water services in New South Wales, mm. whether we're looking at initiatives like that or Finkel recommendations or energy policy, um, we should be able to build communities that are more self-sufficient mm. uh, than, than is currently encouraged by government policy. And is the existing utility infrastructure going to be a barrier to some of this, the, the technological change we're speaking about? I, th I think it's it's a regulatory issue yeah. and, it, it, and it's an issue that requires government leadership. Yeah. Uh, there's no doubt that um, some incumbents are uh, assisted by the current regulatory environment yes. and that's the regulatory environment, so it's up to government to, to shift those some of those barriers mm. uh, and put in place some of the incentives to encourage this. I mean, one of the great initiatives um, uh, and success stories when you look at Green Star and the 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 changing nature of Green Star over the last fifteen years is the birth of Green Star Communities in twenty twelve, mm. which is our our tool within Green Star that that. Um, rates the sustainability of a master planned community uh, yep. and within that looking at things like sustainable utility infrastructure and we've seen some fantastic innovation through the you know we've got 50 communities registered now around Australia okay. and, and some fantastic uh, innovations happening around how they use uh, solar panels or storage facilities how they make use of um, uh, local water or recycle local water. And that's the kind of thing we want to be encouraging more of around the country. Yeah, definitely. And is there an economic incentive for some of these communities just purely on, on all the energy savings and efficiencies there for them to go with the Green Star Communities tool? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the important thing to note about uh, Green Star and Green Star Communities is that it's a holistic rating tool. So mm. when we talk about sustainability, um, we are absolutely talking about energy and waste and water. Um, but we're also talking about a lot of the other attributes of sustainability. Relate, you know, you mentioned resilience, which is really important. Mm. Uh, but we're also talking about uh, community engagement, social inclusion. Uh, we're talking about health and well-being, access to transport. Yes. Um, jobs and productivity and amenities. So, so that holistic view of sustainability, particularly in the case of Green Star communities, absolutely creates an environment that is more desirable for people to live in, um, that, that I think it's fair to say that when people walk into those communities, they recognise that that's yeah. a place that they want to be, that it's where they want to raise their family, where they mm. want to play at the end of the day. Um, so, so that's that. A lot of those intangibles, I think, then manifest themselves in in making that a more attractive value proposition. Yeah, definitely, awesome. So, as we're moving toward the end now, so what what do you are you most excited about for the future of the buildings industry? Well, I think when we when we look ahead, uh, there are a number of uh, drivers and challenges for. Uh, for our sector, when we look at um, some of those trends towards an increasing focus on data and mm. technology and transparency of data, uh, when we look at the role of health and well-being in buildings, once you're in a building, how does it contribute to your health and well-being and how is, how is technology in the future going to inform us on an individual level of how, mm. the, how the building is contributing to that? Um, we need to respond to those challenges. I think when we look at, um, at the role of uh, investors in driving our response to sustainability, mm. um, which is certainly, you know, when we look at Australian leadership in some of those 
global reporting tools like the Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark, which yep. Australia's led for the last seven years, when we look at how investors are driving that agenda, that's really exciting um, yep. because uh, that and an increasing focus by boards on sustainability is going to demand increasing leadership across all aspects of the built environment to deliver the kind of outcomes that we've been leading for the last 15 years. Mm. But it's going to be holistic, I think. is It's not just going to be focused on uh, energy, though obviously that's critically important as we move towards meeting those Paris commitments, but looking more broadly at all those other aspects of sustainability, mm. um, I think how that's driven through the industry is 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 going to be really important. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, um, just through this conversation, I'm much more optimistic about getting to those Paris agreements because, you know, there's, there's clearly a framework and a roadmap that you guys have been working on, which is, you know, awesome to see. Well, we have to be optimistic, don't we? Because <laughs> yeah. the alternative is not great. It's so, not great, is it? So we have to, um, we have to embrace that optimism. Um, but I think if you look at the transformation that's happened um, over the last 15 years through, through Greenstar, where we've really moved to a place where... At, you know, we've got 30% of, 37% of, of CBD office space is Green Star certified. Wow. I mean, that's an extraordinary... That's crazy, 15. In 15 years, yeah. that's an extraordinary result. Uh, so if we can achieve that in 15 years, mm. then imagine what is possible with ongoing industry leadership and yeah. investor leadership and yeah. leadership, hopefully, by governments... Uh, in the years ahead, uh, I think that is cause for, for optimism. Yep, definitely. Um, and if people want to find out more about yourself or Green Star and the develop and all the things, great things you guys are up to, where can they find you? Yeah, absolutely. Visit our website. Yep, uh, easy. Drop me a line. I'm sure my details are up there somewhere. Uh, but um, but yeah, yeah, the website's always a good source, and you can sign up to our our newsletters and and stay up to date with everything that's happening in green building in Australia. Hey guys, Adam here. Just before you go, just one quick request. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a review. It helps our rating and ranking on iTunes so more people can hear from the people who are making our cities better places for our future.